Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Bribery. Who's? <laughs> <laughs> Only hundred dollars. No, uh, there was a personal connection. Uh, if you saw the credits carefully, there was General Sam Cohen, and uh, I, I met him several years ago at Oxford, and he had seen some of my films. And actually, this film grew out of another film that I was working on, a film on masculinities, and uh, for that film my idea was to look at men in different work situations. And one of the men work settings that I chose was to be a soldier. So little did I know that it was almost impossible to get into the British camp. And when I found out that, I, I wrote a letter to Sam, who I had been kind of involved in on a personal matter. I was actually doing him a little favor and asked him, you know, how should I, how should I approach the British embassy for permission? And the next thing I knew was he had uh, sent the strongest recommendation. And then they sort of vetted my films and interviewed me. And I went to the British camp, so she would have filmed to the Nepali officers and uh, told them what I wanted to do. And then it was uh, smooth sailing after that. Yeah. Kesson, thank you for that. That was such a stunning um, film in so many ways. I'm wondering what sort of reactions you've received um, from the soldiers, both the Nepali soldiers and the British officers who've seen the film. Well, soldiers are not generally very expressive. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me if there are. But uh, I, I shoot it at the British camp, uh, at the Pokhra British camp, as well as the uh, British camp in Kathmandu, and they all sort of nodded their heads and applauded. And apparently it was shown at Sandhurst uh, uh, without me knowing about it, but apparently a uh, thousand people applauded and so forth. And uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, uh, the, the very few comments I got was some of the Nepali officers in Pokhara sort of turned around and said, you know, these white guys don't get it. Uh, you know, they are like really sympathetic to someone who might be, have a shuffle in the leg and so forth. And uh, we know that they won't get in, so we sort of uh, are brutal and honest and, and, and take them out, whereas the British tend to be sentimental and let them mourn and so forth. So this was the only comment I got. Uh, very strange. But uh, after the first screening in Kathmandu, at the Kathmandu Mountain Film Festival, uh, I, I obviously had a bit of trepidation, because while you want to do the film that you want to do, you, you always have a feeling when you encounter the persons who are somewhat involved, whether they think they've been betrayed or they don't like it or they're not in the film. And to my surprise, the British ambassador was said he was thrilled. And at the same time, there were many Nepalis who were very emotional, said who were very emotionally affected by it. So it was a strange uh, kind of a response. And this response has been going on through all the very many screenings. So uh, I don't know why, but uh, you know, maybe it got beyond the polemics of there is a debate, and it kind of got the feeling of uh, uh, the experience and the people who have a, have a part in it, who have a stake in this, maybe. In the final ironic scene, uh, I heard some laugh laughter in the audience. Uh, I was not one of them. I, I don't think any Nepali could uh, laugh by that time. I was also crying by that time. Well, I think the people in the audience, someone might could comment on that. I mean, I, I don't know if, it, uh, if there's laughter, but there's maybe uh, kind of Awkward laughter, maybe. Uh, that, that would be my reading, actually. Yeah. It's a different reaction. Yeah. True, true. It is a different reaction. Uh, I think uh, 
for most Nepalis, it was actually very uh, emotionally affecting. And <clears throat> in the first couple of screenings I had in Amsterdam, uh, <clears throat> many people liked the film and thought that, you know, what's the stakes in it? You know, everyone goes into the army, everyone is, uh, goes out for some rigorous contest, you know, in work and so forth. So I, I think film is uh, very malleable and ultimately it's the, not even ultimately, initially and ultimately, it's really the encounter between who is seeing and what is there. And what is there is, you know, is there's so many elements there which are read differently, uh, affected, affect people differently. Uh, that's the only thing I can say. Yeah. Kizan, thank you for that film. I was struck by your use of archival footage, and I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on the material that you did use and how you encountered it and what your sort of experience on seeing it uh, for the first time was. Yeah, this was, I think, the biggest problem, the challenge, because uh, the Gurkha is a major narrative of Nepal, as we all know. And uh, so how to kind of <clears throat> uh, not do justice to that, to the history, and at the same time, the film I wanted to make was not a kind of a BBC, kind of a historical uh, narration-driven film, uh, expositional film. So <clears throat> the, really the answer was to find archival material that would say, uh, that would show uh, what I did not want to say. And uh, so finding, finding it was a, a challenge. And I had a good friend in the UK who went to the two museums and we had a long process of finding footage on low res, sending it to me, and then looking at it to see what fits the bill. So it was uh, the uh, Gurkha Museum in Winchester and the Imperial War Museum. And some of the footage is from the First World War. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. My reaction to uh, laughter was, uh, you laugh so you don't cry. <laughs> Chatinla, that was a very um, strong movie, I think, especially given the fact that much of um, our part of the world, um, economics determine a lot of these. And, and, and this is going on um, in terms of exporting a lot of the youth from our region you know, for, for economic opportunities looking elsewhere, the Middle East definitely. And of course for Nepal, I mean, it, it's had a long history of, of that through the Gurkhas and, and now of course in the, <coughs> in the Middle East with the construction and many other uh, labor. Bhutan is, is, is also treading along a similar path. I, I wouldn't say it's exactly the same. It's, it's um, deliberate. It's also creating jobs and opportunities. But sometimes I think society, I think, is, is divided. You know, on, on the one hand, I think you're looking at youth and, and unemployment, and, and somehow you feel like exporting your youth for jobs and, and, and such elsewhere <clears throat> could hopefully maybe resolve some of the economic um, problems at home. But for Bhutan, it hasn't hit hard right now. And, and things are going relatively. I mean, we have been fortunate. But in, in the minds of some people, they think sending unskilled workers abroad and then them sending back the money, I mean, as is done in many parts of the, our part of the world, so looking at that as a solution, I, I think this is a message that I, I could, could truly see and, and is a path that I wish that our countries, you know, will, will not tread on. But your message, I think it's been, it, it's a very powerful film and we thank you for that. Thank you. So. Uh, well, I mean, if you, uh, you know, I think in some way uh, the the phenomena of Nepalis going to the Gulf to work is understandable uh, because they, there's not enough jobs. And uh, while, while the Gurkha recruitment, uh, especially now, uh, the fellows who join the British Gurkhas are not necessarily from poor families. Uh, for for you know, decades, it was uh, uh, the poor people from the hills, uh, many of whom actually swear that this was 
the opening, the, the opening of their minds. And this was the chance, this was what gave them the world, the ability to see the world. Uh, this is in relation to the debate about recruitment and not. Uh, it's, I think, very complex. But in, the, in this case, yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, I think there are some poor people, but there are quite a lot of well-off uh, applicants, uh, one of them who failed. Uh, I, I saw in Amsterdam, he was studying medicine. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, I mean, I think in the sort of compulsion to go abroad, this is one route because uh, you put in a few years and uh, if you get in after four and a half years, uh, well, firstly, the salary is at parity with a British soldier. Uh, after four and a half years, you can retire and uh, leave the army and actually get a second career, a training in a second career. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, and, and the numbers right now for British uh, Gurkha recruitment is down to about 100 a year. So in a way, you know, uh, in terms of the debate, in a way, it's, 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 so, it's so few that uh, I don't think it's such a big debate. Uh, uh, but in terms of uh, people going to the Gulf, there's two to three million young Nepalis in the Gulf and Malaysia. And... Uh, I think it's a class phenomenon is because most of Kathmandu would be indignant at the fact that these people are going. And I think, uh, you know, these just have to look a little harder to see why people go, actually. And it's more a middle class, upper class sentimentalism, I feel. Uh, I mean, there, there are lots of quantitative uh, sort of actual reasons why there might be some, you know, like there's a shortage of plumbers and people say, look, they could have been here. But I think the point is people, I think, act fairly rationally in deciding to go. It's a necessity. And uh, uh, if, if Nepalese just looked at <clears throat> the salary kind of scheme back in Nepal, then they would actually understand why people go to get maybe 20,000 rupees a month. It's not easy to earn 20,000 rupees a month. And the same for maids. People say, oh, our women shouldn't go. But the maids get 15,000 rupees a month. I don't say that's a good thing, but I think people have to ask themselves, look at the society. I don't blame any class, but the fact is people, you know, get uh, a fraction of that. So there's, I feel that uh, on the whole, it's fairly rational why people are going in terms of their, you know, where they are and looking at opportunities to the left and right and, and then making that decision because they know for sure all the horror stories that are happening. So, I mean, I've rambled on about the Gulf workers, but that's, uh, I also worked on three films about Nepalese who go to the Gulf, so, yeah. So, th thank you very much. That was a beautiful and powerful film. I, I don't know, this is not exactly a question, but just a request for you to comment on, uh, at one point early in the film, the claim is made that, um, success or failure is completely independent of the cast of the applicants. And then you have that one little scene at the end where someone's gotten in and the, the Gurkhas who are already in, you know, are sort of expressing surprise at, oh, you got in? And I wonder if you could just comment more about that. Well, uh, I, I mean, as far as I could see, you know, as you see, the, the way of filming was... Uh, uh, you know, filming as a way of research, you know, direct cinema as it's called in America. And uh, I didn't do a lot of research. I, I read a little bit. Uh, I didn't really know a hell of a lot about it. And the point is, what do we catch on the camera is, is, is what we get, right? So from what I could see, I, I didn't really see, you know, any blatant, uh, uh, have any suspicion for, you know, foul play, as it were. But as you, as you saw in the film, they, it probably does happen. And maybe it was a much more pervasive phenomena earlier on. And maybe that's also part of the reason why I was allowed in, because maybe they felt that in the, in the bazaar, the, the perception is that it's all rigged up. And uh, maybe they thought, you know, it's time to let people know what happens. So, uh, yeah, as far as I know, I mean, there, there were people from the Tarai who were in. Now, whether in this, there's a lot of tests and whether the markings are, Obviously, there's a degree of subjectivity. I, I'm, I'm not actually, you know, sort of defending the, or, you know, asserting that it's total fair. 
but it, it appeared like that to me. Two final questions. Hi, that was a beautiful film. Thank you very much. I have a question about something that's sort of outside the frame that was referenced a few times. Uh, it seems there's an interesting parallel between the manpower agencies and the training programs that they kept referencing. You were talking about class and how certain, certain uh, apart from caste, about how certain people of a certain class tend to go out for this and certain people of a certain class might have the resources to prepare for it using one of these programs it's referenced. So could you talk a little bit more about that? Well, I mean, it's, it's uh, what I know is what's there. Uh, I think it's a big, it's a really tough contest. And actually, the, the, it, it's really a big deal for these young fellows who are applying because some of them have been trying for three or four times. That means four years. And, uh, and you know, they've actually sort of uh, inducted the Gurkha ideology. They've already become Gurkhas, uh, except they're not in. So it's a really hugely, uh, I've heard of many cases of young people being devastated and traumatized by this for, for years. Uh, so, you know, they use all the means they can to go to training for three or four weeks, and, but it's a tough test. I mean, you saw the, the, when they were getting, you know, their timings read, it was like milliseconds, uh, you know, so it's very tough. And I think, in fact, many of them, some of the British officers said, all the 500 who were in the final selection could have actually you know, fully qualified, but it's just that they were so few births. Does that answer the question? Or? The flame is really wonderful, uh, but I don't know how to uh, uh, put my question in words. But uh, I heard, uh, let me put my question in a plain language. Um, I heard, you know, free, fair, is the script free, fair, and transparent three or four times. Mm. Um, uh, and uh, it was, was it needed uh, or uh, because the uh, British Embassy gave you permission or whether they asked you, uh, uh, you know, uh, put these things in words? And because I have heard many yeah. stories about, you know, yeah. Uh, discrimination. Some castes are favored, not others. Um, and also, uh, you know, after recruitment, uh, British, I, I don't think British officers, but in the British uh, camps, uh, you know, uh, uh, those candidates who passed um, the, you know, test, they are forced to, you know, adopt uh, Hindu religion and other sort of uh, things. Um, and what's uh, your uh, thoughts on uh, these uh, matters? Yeah, the reason why I, I put it in uh, is okay. because I think uh, uh, in this setting, I mean, when you, for me, the archetypal reason why someone goes to war is to fight for the for the for the soil, for the motherland, and they're not doing that, obviously. And so, therefore, in the vacuum, I think uh, institution creates an ideology. So, in the place of like you have to go and fight and you know give up your blood. Uh, maybe these values come in as the dominant ideological points, i.e. this is a fair, you know, transparent uh, institutions, whereas outside in Nepal, outside the gates of the uh, Pohra camp, it's not. Uh, the water is portable, you can drink water from any of the taps in the camp, whereas outside you cannot. Don't make a noise in here, don't make halla, because this is not Nepal, this is an island. So this is the sense that I wanted to, uh, was my intention, because, I mean, you know, uh, it's not to back up my earlier uh, observation that maybe it is fair. Uh, it was with irony, in a way, right? So, uh, yeah. And, and, and I, ironic, further, ironically, I mean, the young fellow who sings the song, sings a song about the motherland. So, you know, there are, I mean, I think you have to make sense of that, I think. I, I feel that people have emotions and, you know, where they choose to be the, what they choose to be the repository of the emotions is, you know, uh, you, you know, sometimes you find yourself singing a, uh, uh, a totally, uh, you know, kitsch pop song, but actually your emotion is not kitsch, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, that's the way I see it. Kesang, um, I don't often run out of words but I've run out. 
So, thank you. And uh, thanks for making the film. Let's have dinner. Thank you very much. Thank you.